The best place to play fantasy football this summer is Underdog Fantasy. Their Best Ball Mania tournament has $10 million in total prize money, and the best part is you just draft your fantasy team and that's it. There's no waivers, no trades, no in-season management. Underdog gives you your best score each week, and at the end of the year, the champion wins. And the champion last year drafted in June, so there's no better time than the present to join and take a shot at a million dollars at Underdog Fantasy. Plus, if you sign up with promo code PFF, we'll, they will double your deposit up to $100. And if you use 10 of those dollars, you get a free PFF subscription. So what are you waiting for? Head to underdogfantasy.com or the App Store. Play with $10 in code PFF and draft your best ball mania team today. Alrighty, everyone. Welcome in to the Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon edition of Unexpected Points. Just me this week, no guest, but I do have a lot of prep that I put into this episode. It's an idea I had for a while was building on thinking about rankings of quarterbacks of all time. Different discussions have come up. Recently, someone was asked, I think it was Ryan Fitzpatrick who their top quarterback of all time was. And he said it was Peyton Manning, which instinctually I kind of agree with uh, being a peak person, you know, a peak career uh, supporter versus longevity in these circumstances. But I wasn't quite sure if that would be the case if I tried to build a credible stats case. And then earlier this week, I went over the goat tight ends looking at Gronk, looking at Tony Gonzalez, going all the way back to John Mackey and others. And it got me interested in doing a similar exercise with the quarterback position. But I want it to be very, very precise here. So this is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to give you the beginning of my top 50 list for what I'm calling the QB GOAT list. So the greatest of all time at the quarterback position. And I don't want to get into too much of the nitty gritty on here, but I do think what's really interesting is building this in a very regimented and statistical manner comes up with a list, at least at the top, that matches pretty closely what you'd assume a list would be if you just asked Hall of Fame voters or someone like that to come up with a list. And it shows you the power of being able to harness you know, statistics, especially for a position like quarterback, where we have pretty good statistics, being able to harness that, put together something, get a precise zero, I mean, sorry, precise one through 50 list quickly without having to go, you know, watch the film for every single player and go through. Now, of course, I've watched most of these players in my lifetime. I'm a bit of an old, so I have seen some of the, even some of the older players here, but not all of them. Um, For the exact parameters on this, I'm going back to quarterbacks who played at least a substantial majority of their career after 1946, which is a defining point of, you know, the modern NFL. It's weird to think about 1946 as being modern, but there was a change as far as forward passing and everything else that went on in that era where it doesn't match what's gone on today with all the innovations in the passing game and the volume in the passing game, but at least it looked somewhat like the game that we see today in the NFL. So that's the starting point looking through all these quarterbacks. And I'll get into the specifics of the methodology, but before I do that, if you want to just the big picture way to think about how these rankings are coming together is it's an efficiency-based ranking system. So it's going to rely heavily upon yards per attempt as the foundation for quarterback play and then adjustments that you make for Touchdowns and interceptions, normally those adjustments are 20 extra yards for each touchdown and you subtract 45 yards for interceptions. And then for sacks, when we have the sack information, which we do not have prior to around, I think it's 1969-ish. So when we do have the sack information, we're including each one of those sacks as a drop back in the denominator for what we're dividing by. And we're subtracting out those sack yards to get what they call the adjusted net yards per attempt. Of course, we have expected points added and things like that for more modern players. But since we're going all the way back here, I want to be able to judge these players on a one-by-one basis. And that is the main stat. Now, there are adjustments for volume in that 
you were compared to that year in the NFL and whether or not you have more passing attempts than your average team would have during that year. You get more credit for your efficiency. If you're above that, you get less credit if you're below that. And once we have those efficiency measures, then we're enhancing it by adding rushing into the equation. And again, looking at the quarterback's rushing yards and their rushing touchdowns, giving the 20 point bonus for the rushing touchdowns, 20 yard bonus for the, for the rushing touchdowns. And then looking at that contribution, that as a percentage of your typical passing game. So what would, what are you adding? If you're adding a thousand yards on the ground as a quarterback, what is that like an extra contribution in the passing game for how much you're accounting for in the offense? And then I'm adding that into it. So that's really how it works, whether I'm looking at the regular season or the playoffs, that's how it's going to work as being part of that efficiency number that everything is built upon. Then when I'm mixing it all up, when I'm mixing it all together to come up with the rankings, you can think of it as five parts. You can think of it as three parts, career, regular season numbers. So 60% of the measure is based upon their career regular season accumulated, how much they've accumulated kind of over league average play during their entire career and efficiency, how much they've accumulated that entire time. Three parts of that. So you get rewarded for the longevity there. Uh, one part peak play. So we look at every player looks at a rolling five-year period of their career and their best rolling five-year period as far as efficiency over average uh, value over average that they're adding to their team. That is one part of the equation. So that is, you know, roughly 20% of the equation. The final 20% is playoff efficiency. So it's looking at the playoffs and it's not just how many games they're playing in the playoffs. Cause a lot of these quarterbacks we think are great playoff performers because they kept on winning and their team kept on advancing and they played a lot of games in the playoffs. They weren't necessarily the most efficient players in the playoffs. So what I'm looking for is, you have to be playing in the playoffs and the uh, when you're playing at an above league average level as far as your efficiency is concerned, you get credit for that. You get dinged when you're far below league average type, a bad game. And then if you've played more games, you are going to get more credit be if you've been performing at a high level during those games. But high level performance is a very, very important. You're not just getting credit for being there. If the defense is winning games, if you're having poor games, but advancing on the playoffs, these quarterbacks are not getting credit for that. But other, other quarterbacks who just go absolutely bonkers in the playoffs, one guy I can think of is Terry Bradshaw. His numbers are just bonkers in the playoffs. He gets a lot of credit for how far above the average quarterback level play that he was playing and how much he stepped up his game in the playoffs. And that, again, is a 20% of the total calculation. And mixing all those together, I get the rankings. I ranked approximately 115 different quarterbacks I thought could be in the ballpark for maybe being a top 50 type of quarterback of all time, and then brought it all together and have the rankings for each one of these things. So as I go through this here, as I go through quarterback 50 to 41 today, the first 10 uh, for a five-part series that I'm going to go through here, for each quarterback, I'm going to discuss their ranking their actual qb goat ranking so their overall ranking i'm going to discuss their career number for efficiency their peak their rushing contribution which is built into that efficiency just so you see that broken out and you can get a good idea of how much has been driven by that and then lastly their playoff ranking so these are all be rankings and you'll see the guys are ranked anywhere between one and 115 on here but of course most of these rankings are going to be fairly low since these are guys who made it into the top 50. Before I start with the top 50, though, let's talk about some honorable mentions or guys who are who are probably going to jump in here, whether I want them to or not, are going to jump into the top 50 in the future. One is Matthew Stafford. So Stafford right now is at 57. He has a, a good career number. Uh, he's in the top 50. His career number already in his 13 seasons is a top 50 type of numbers, how much value he's added throughout his regular season career. But his peak number is low. Uh, maybe a couple more years like he did last year where he had a great, he had a great uh, year last year. Maybe he'll, he'll raise that peak number up quite a bit there. His playoff ranking is okay. It's at 40. It's not great, but it's okay there. And his rushing rank is 64. So not that high of a rushing rank, which brings him down again to 57th rank. But 
couple more years, he's going to pop into the top 50. Another guy is Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins is in that same sort of range, right around 60 right now. Um, the dude just performs. <laughs> he's just efficient. I don't know what else to say about it. I think he's had six straight years now of well above average efficiency in a, in a basis of adjusted net yards per attempt. So his peak number is in the top 50. His career number is in the top 50. And his playoffs, he hasn't been, he's only played three playoff games, so he doesn't have a lot there. He only has nine seasons that he's qualified for. So once he pumps up, bumps up that number, is having some more seasons of at least having 150 pass attempts, he'll get in there more. And I think he's going to end up finding his way into the top 50 eventually, also in his career, even though many of you may not like that. Um, a likely Hall of Famer who does not make it to the top 50 is Eli Manning. He comes in at 60. Uh, just doesn't have the efficiency. He's just in the 60s as far as his career and his peak efficiency. Uh, he is 40th in playoffs, and I know you think his number would be even better for playoffs, but the problem was in all of their one-and-done seasons, he stunk. So he they went into the playoffs. You know, they have 12 playoff games, right? So a few different seasons, those were going through and winning the playoffs and winning the Super Bowl in two of those years. The rest of them were one-and-done, and he was really, really poor in those in those games. Uh, which detracted from his his playoff number there. And of course, he does not rush the ball that much. So he's number 60 and is not going to be part of this. Phil Sims, 64, is someone to consider. Cam Newton, 58, is another guy where it doesn't look like he's going to get enough opportunities to bump in there, but he is third all time in his rushing value added, which boosts up his numbers a little bit there. Carson Palmer, 66. Um, Dave Craig, 68, is another interesting name there. And Michael Vick at 65. Michael Vick actually added the most rushing efficiency of anyone because of the fact that in his day, the numbers that he was putting up versus normal passing offenses was just was just obviously incredible there. But didn't really have the playoff success, didn't really have the efficiency throwing it to actually qualify there. So those are names that you might be thinking of when I'm going through this list and say, hey, where are these guys? And unfortunately, the reality is they just did not make it. Okay. So I'm going to bring up here on the screen pictures with all the different relevant information for the different players here, because some of these guys you're not going to have heard a lot of because they're a little bit on the older side. So let's go first to uh, number 50 on the, the GOAT list, and that is Billy Kilmer. Billy Kilmer is probably someone you haven't heard a lot about here. I'll bring him up on the on the list. You can see here that he played for the Redskins uh, at the time for the majority of his career. It wasn't a lot, um, but that was really in the latter half of his career where he ended up getting some MVP votes once in his 32 and 33-year-old seasons. Before that, he played for the Saints and he played for the San Francisco 49ers. He was drafted in the first round. Uh, only one Pro Bowl for him. So he doesn't have much of a lauded career as far as um, as far as accolades are concerned. But if you when you dig into some of the numbers and you look at what he's done, he had some really excellent efficiency seasons. I mean, for most of the time that he was with Washington, he was well above average in his efficiency, which gave him some pretty good numbers to work off of here. We see that his career efficiency, he was 54th. He was 50th in peak. Uh, his rushing was 88th and his playoffs was 44. And in one year, if you look at what happened with uh, Kilmer in the playoffs, they did go all the way and lose in the Super Bowl in 1972. 1972, the same year where he ended up getting some MVP votes and finally getting voted into the Pro Bowl. So a little bit of an accumulator here. As someone who played 12 different seasons with three different teams, but he just had this consistently good play, but was not really seen as being a great quarterback in his time and in his day. So I think this is one where he's going to be ranked a bit higher by my numbers and with a concentration on efficiency, then you're necessarily going to see him ranked with, with others. Okay, let's go to now the next gentleman going down to 49 on the list. This is a name that if you guys are historians that you'll know about, and that's Bobby Lane. Bobby Lane, uh, a.k.a. the Blonde Bomber. So again, a guy who played a little bit early in his career. We're going to get to some modern guys eventually. Don't worry here. 
But uh, Bobby Lane played for the Chicago Bears in 1948, the New York Bulldogs in 1949, the Lions in 1950 through 58, and then the Pittsburgh Steelers in 58 through 62. So what can we say about Bobby Lane? Number one, he's a Hall of Famer. So he's pretty low on this list for someone who is a Hall of Famer. If we go to, I should, I should look this up beforehand. So the Hall of Fame, NFL, how many quarterbacks are in the NFL Hall of Fame? 42 quarterbacks. Um, and there are 27 modern era quarterbacks who are in the, the Hall of Fame. Um, so the fact that this guy's all the way, Bobby Lane's all the way down on at 40, kind of shows you how much lower he is according to this this number than most. Now, when I the more I read about Lane, what I figured out is that he number one he won a lot. So he was 40 and 48 as a starter, won three championships, and he was kind of known for this extreme natural talent which he didn't necessarily um you know, he wasn't Peyton Manning, let's say. He was more of a Brett Favre than Peyton Manning. And important here when you look at Lane's numbers, you know, the, the career number of 56 isn't that great. The peak is pretty good at 35, but rushing seventh. So he was he was a force rushing the ball. And this is back way back in the, in the day, of course. If you look at some of his numbers, he has 2,400 total rushing yards over his career. He was putting up 250, 300, 400 rushing yards a season here. Great athleticism while also being someone who four different times in his career, sorry, five different times in his career, led the NFL in yards per completion, was throwing for over 200 yards a game in an era where that was not happening, led the NFL in passing yards multiple, multiple seasons. So he wasn't the most efficient, which this is going to, which, which this um, analysis is going to rely on a bit here, but he was seen as being a top, top, top player. Again, he made the Hall of Fame. He was contemporary of other guys we'll see on this list higher up like uh, Norm Van Brocklin and Y.A. Tittle, and he was seen as being a better guy uh, in a lot of quarters than those quarterbacks were. Uh, so that's going to just show you that while the efficiency might not have been there, everything else is there for Lane. And like I said, he's in the Hall of Fame, so he's someone who should be respected and is a highly, highly touted guy throughout the NFL. Okay, let's get just some names of people that we've heard about before. We're going to go to number 48 on the QB GOAT list, and that is Randall Cunningham. Randall Cunningham, 48th overall. He's His career efficiency accumulation and value is 50th. His peak is 58th. His rushing is 5th. Uh, again, this is of 114 different quarterbacks in here, so very, very high. Playoffs, 55th. It didn't, didn't do a whole lot in the playoffs. So I think Cunningham is too low on this list, although, you know, he's, I don't believe he's ever even been a finalist for the hall of fame before. I don't think Cunningham has ever been a finalist before. And the difference here is he, he was stats have been held down by poor surrounding teammates, injuries, and really sacks. If you look at Cunningham here in, in his numbers, he led the league in sacks taken five different times. He led the league in sack total sack yards taken six different times. And when he was playing with Philadelphia, his two top receivers were um, Keith Jackson, a tight end, and uh, Keith Byers, a running back. You know, fine players, fine receivers, but not the type of options that are really going to give you much of a ceiling there. And that held down his, his efficiency early in his career. If you look at Cunningham, he's one of these players who broke out really in his third year after having pretty awful efficiency in his first two seasons, especially as far as sacks is concerned. He was just taking tons and tons of sacks those first couple of seasons. And then his efficiency started to blossom in the middle years when he was playing for Philadelphia. What's most interesting about him and what I think gives Cunningham really the case for being much better than 48th on this list, someone who could probably be in the 30s, someone who could probably be in real Hall of Fame contention, is that he again, once he finally got some talent, he did not have talent in Philadelphia for the most part. Once he finally got some talent, and he got some really high end talent at 35 years old in 1988. He had the most efficient year of his career. He led the NFL in adjusted net yards per attempt. Best player in the NFL that year. He was a uh, AP first team all pro. He was second in the MVP voting behind Terrell Owens. So he was the number one uh, voting as far as a quarterback is concerned. 
And, you know, he, he showed this talent before him. Mean, he was twice before that behind Joe Montana and Boomer Esiason for MVPs early in his career and had another year where he was a second team all pro that he that he that you can also add to this mix. So he really had four high, high end seasons, but especially once he got hooked up with Chris Carter and Randy Moss in Minnesota, 1998, he showed what an amazing ceiling that he had as a player. Never really had that opportunity before, and that's what's holding him down a little bit in these career and peak numbers, that he just didn't accumulate enough of those high-end seasons to really be considered that high. But he's definitely someone that should get a lot more consideration when it comes to the Hall of Fame. Okay, next we're going to go to 47 here on the the goat list and it is Dante Culpepper. Culpepper is maybe the flip side of the um of the Randall Cunningham discussion because his peak if you see here he's 15th as far as his peak for for his career. 15th best peak of any quarterback in modern NFL history. That is a big, big number, but his career is only 63rd because he had a fairly shortened career. He came into the league in 19, 1999 with the Vikings. He basically did nothing as a rookie. Then he came in with playing with those same players that we talked about Randall Cunningham getting at the end of his career, getting to play with Chris Carson, Chris Carter, excuse me, and uh, Randy Moss. And immediately stepping in and having huge, huge seasons. I mean, his second NFL season, he led the league in touchdown percentage. He was in the top three in his adjusted net yards per attempt. He maintained being basically average the next two seasons. And then the two seasons after that had another two huge, huge numbers, especially in 2004, uh, what went on there. He went to the Pro Bowl, Pro Bowl three times, but he never made an all-pro team. He never got any MVP votes. He wasn't seen as being on that sort of level. So I think he's more the guy where his numbers are reflecting – the great rushing production that he had, you know, he was putting up anywhere from 600 to 400 yards per game for a five, six year stretch. Uh, and just an amazing peak that he had there. Amazing physical talent, being able to throw the ball down the field, but it might've been more a function of the surroundings that he had there than someone who could perform that well anywhere he went. You know, he had some injuries and then he kind of fell off after that. And he had some cleanup years in Oakland and in Detroit to end his career where he didn't really do anything. So he's just not going to have the big time accumulation of numbers over his career. And that's just not going to get him there. And as far as the playoffs are concerned, despite having these fantastic numbers during the regular season, he only played in four playoff games and his, his efficiency in those games was a little bit below what he averaged for his career. So nothing that fantastic as, as far as what it goes, what it goes for. Um, it's just more of the peak peak seasons that he had surrounded by talent. We have to discount a little bit because we never saw that happening anywhere else. Okay. Another player, this is going to be a big surprise for people at 46 here, Trent green. Trent Green, yes. You can see him on Sundays if you uh, tune in to, I don't know, is he on CBS or Fox? I'm pretty sure he's on CBS. Trent Green, number 46 here. His career is 51, so he doesn't have that high of a career number, but his peak is 25. He's another guy with a top, top, top peak here. Uh, his rushing is 72 and his playoffs are 79, so not there much for rushing and for playoffs. Okay, so you're going to say, Trent Green, this sounds ridiculous because Trent Green, he only played in two Pro Bowls despite the fact that he was a starting quarterback for, I don't know, 10 different seasons. So he didn't have a lot. He didn't have a lot of seasons that he played. So he looks kind of bad there uh, in some part. But the thing is, when he finally got a chance to play, and he was an eighth-round pick, number 222 overall, uh, back in the day when the NFL draft had many more rounds, he did not really get a chance to do anything for most of his career. It wasn't until... The year 2000, he was already 30, 31 years old. He came in for um, for Kurt Warner when Kurt Warner got injured, stepped in, started five games, led the NFL in adjusted yards per attempt at nine adjusted yards per attempt, uh, 260 yards per game, a QB rating of over 102, the passer rating over 102. And he had a 7% touchdown rate, just an enormous touchdown rate. So he stepped in and immediately 
immediately look like a superstar stepping into the same offense that made Kirk Warner, you know, an MVP multiple times and made him eventually get into the Hall of Fame. Now, what did he do with Kansas City these next few years? Um, again, he had great surroundings in Kansas City. So maybe I should just say that first off, and that's probably why he didn't get a lot of credit. He had two Hall of Fame offensive linemen in Willie Rofe and Will Shields. He had the greatest tight end potentially of all time in Tony Gonzalez. I put him second, but anyway. Uh, he had standout running backs, Priest Holmes, Brian Waters. You know, there was a sense that he just was not the one who was necessarily leading the team there. But if you look at a four-year period here from 2002 to 2005, he was second in passing yards to Peyton Manning, above Tom Brady, above Brett Favre. And if you look at his net yards per attempt, again, second to Peyton Manning, well at, at 7.2 net yards per attempt, well above Tom Brady, well above Brett Favre at 6.4 and 6.4 each. So for a four-year period, and maybe even a little bit more into a five-year period, he was, you know, a clear second efficiency-wise to Peyton Manning over these other quarterbacks like Tom Brady and Brett Favre. I don't think that's something you can really just discount and throw out there. Um, and you combine that with the fact that when he had this first half season that he came in for Kurt Warner, he looked incredible. He basically was playing at an MVP level at that at, at that point in time there. Now, do I think he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame? No, I don't. He just doesn't have enough accumulation over his career for someone who didn't really start playing until he was 30 years old. But he's also someone who shouldn't be slept on and is much better than his two Pro Bowl berths, in my opinion, and should have been given more credit. It just seemed like every year was like, oh, yeah, that's just a, an anomaly that this eighth round pick ended up playing so well. And let's just discount that and, and not pay attention to it. And then he was just doing it year after year after year. But then he eventually just got too old and too injured to be able to continue on. Um, but the next time you see him on a broadcast on Sunday, remember to yourself, hey, this trying green guy is actually a pretty damn good, pretty damn good player. All right. Next on the list is Steve McNair. Steve McNair, 45th. Uh, on the GOAT rankings here. His career efficiency was 46, so right in line there. His peak was 31. He was the 10th best as far as his rushing is concerned, but he was 114th out of 115th in playoffs. He really did not perform well during the playoffs. I mean, pretty interesting career, though, if you think about for accolades perspective from McNair. McNair was in the Pro Bowl three times. He was a co-MVP with Peyton Manning in 2003 and he made it to the Super Bowl in his fifth season in the NFL. He didn't do a lot for his first two seasons, but then he came in and played pretty well there. Ended up as a starter, starter played over 150 started over 150 games with a record of 91 and 62 in those in those starting games. But in the playoffs he just was not very good. Even in that Super Bowl year, his adjusted net yards per attempt was 3.7. And that was in a year where his adjusted net yards per attempt were 5.7 for the entire year. So just had a really awful uh, playoffs, but was carried to that point. And then if you look beyond that, uh, he had a really poor game uh, the next year. They lost. They got knocked down in the first round. Uh, he had 176 yards on 46 attempts, just not efficient there. No touchdowns and interception and took a sack there. Uh, the year after that, the, in 2002 and 2003, he won the original divisional round games, but then got knocked out after that in the next round. Both of those subpar play. And then in his last game where they make the playoffs in Baltimore when he was 33, um, another awful game there. We threw for 130, 173 yards, uh, two INTs, no, no touchdowns. So that keeps him down. That's what keeps him down there, despite the fact that he had a tremendous peak during his late 20s and early 30s in Tennessee, and despite the fact that he had decent production and accumulation here. Now, unfortunately, he did deal with some, some injuries through his career. He would have been a bit higher if not for that. He's another player where, if you think about it, he was kind of like a window into the modern NFL quarterback. At the time that he retired, there were only five players in NFL history who had 30,000 passing yards and 3,000 rushing yards. Those, are, those were John Elway, Donovan McNabb, Fran Tarkenton, 
Steve Young, and then Steve McNair. So all Hall of Famers other than McNair. I do not think you know, McNair is ever going to make it into the Hall of Fame. And unfortunately, we just don't know how how long and productive his career could have been if he wasn't st- dealing with injuries. And then he ended up retiring at 34 years old after falling off a cliff performance wise and with injuries his last season. And of course, you know, his tragic death, which came uh, a number of years ago, kind of adds to some of the sorrow here for what could have been for McNair, because let's remember this guy who came out of Alcorn State. Uh, but still was the third overall pick in the 1995 NFL draft, kind of fulfilled everything you would have wanted for him, all the concerns you may have had with this dual threat type of quarterback. He was really the blueprint for almost all of them that we're seeing in the NFL today. And maybe for that reason, you know, could sneak into the Hall of Fame. I don't see it happening, but uh, he's definitely someone who is is far enough up here on my list to make it a possibility that should be cons- should be considered. All right, before we get to number uh, the last the last five here, or the last four, I should say, on the QB GOAT list, let's hit some ads here, buddy. Manscaped. Gentlemen, we all strive for gold in our lives, right? Gold medals, gold watches, gold everything. However, there's a certain type of man who goes the extra mile. He walks with the confidence of an eagle and giggles in the face of danger. He is big, hairless, winning machine. And when he unzips his pants, you see platinum. That's right. Manscaped's platinum package is available for you. Join 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with code PFF. Brand new Platinum Package 4.0 is the biggest bundle they've ever offered, giving you a bulk discount on Manscaped's top products. Get 20% off and free shipping with code PFF at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code PFF. It's time for you to enjoy the finer things in life and get yourself a Platinum Package for your Platinum Package. All right, let's go to number 44. Again, we're going to be a little bit of a blast of the past here, a name many of you may not have heard of, but it is Burt Jones. Burt Jones, one of the all-time great Colts quarterback, he comes in 44th overall on the list here, 21st in his peak. So he was a good, strong peak player, 52nd overall in career. He was a rusher. He was a bit of a dual threat quarterback himself, 28th in his rushing and 46th in the playoffs. Um, What can we say about Jones here? He was the NFL MVP in 1976 and a second team all pro in 1977. He's not a Hall of Famer. I doubt that he'll ever make the Hall of Fame here, but he did because of that MVP and first team all pro the first team and then he also was an all pro second team all pro the year after that this was in his third and fourth seasons when he was 24 and 25 years old uh that gave him quite a healthy peak there for how he was able to play and how he's able to perform in these metrics he was another guy who has a shortened career he had a shoulder injury um you know outstanding player during that peak. But then once he had the shoulder injury in his mid twenties, everything kind of fell off beyond that point. And if you look at what he did in the playoffs, that also hurts him a little bit here. His playoff years were in his mid twenties. They went one and done in all three playoff games and his adjusted net yards per attempt in those playoff games is 3.2 versus a career number over five. So he fell off his play fell off in those playoff games and wasn't able to get it done. And again, though, when the rushing is concerned in his mid twenties, he was averaging 200, 300 yards rushing every season. He was averaging three to four touchdowns during those seasons too. So that's what gave him quite a bump on some of that, on some of those numbers, but the rushing did not come through in the playoffs either. He only had 33 total rushing yards in those three games, the three one and done games in the playoffs for Burt Jones. Okay, next is a name that should be familiar for a lot of people here. Joe Theismann. Good story here for Joe Theismann is, I don't don't know, this could be apocryphal. But my dad was a big Raiders fan growing up in Oakland. He was in Oakland at the time when they were in Oakland. And then they moved to LA and we were down down in Southern California. And then they moved back, back up to Oakland. So my dad was also a big Jim Plunkett fan. My dad's a West Coast guy. He grew up in Seattle. He went to school at Berkeley uh, and then settled down in Southern California. So Jim Plunkett versus Joe Theismann, as far as the uh, Heisman Trophy was concerned, they were battling against each other. Plunkett for the Stanford Cardinal, Theismann for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. And the story is that Theismann's name before that was pronounced Theismann. 
but he changed it to Joe Theismann to rhyme with Heisman. And then he didn't end up winning the Heisman. <laughs> Plunkett, Plunkett ended up winning the Heisman, although Theisman was a Heisman, a Heisman finalist. So I think Theisman's a guy where I may have had some negative associations with him because of this whole Theisman versus Plunkett sort of thing. Theisman clearly had the better career, though. And as you dig more into more about what he was doing, um, he's probably someone who deserves some real Hall of Fame contention but is not getting it probably because of the perceived strength of his team. He has an MVP in 1983. He has a Super Bowl championship where he played really well. And overall in his career, uh, they lost another Super Bowl. So they won one Super Bowl and they lost one Super Bowl. Both of those playoff runs, he was excellent. He had around seven adjusted net yards per attempt when you know his career average was around five, six during his peak year. So he played even better. He took his game to another level in the playoffs and he's also a guy where i wouldn't have thought about it necessarily because again he's someone where you like one of the one of the things that's that's plastered in everyone's mind even if you type his name into google right now you're going to see him lying limp on the ground after having his leg shattered by lawrence taylor which ended his career was that the dude could run pretty well too 1800 total rushing yards over his career and 17 touchdowns over his career. Even in those playoff uh, games, he had a hundred yards rushing during, during all those different, different playoff games. And like I mentioned before, he won the MVP 34 years old, uh, led the NFL in adjusted yards per attempt that year. Really, really strong. He was fourth in the MVP voting the year before that. So it is a little, I think he's someone that people don't have a full appreciation for, because if you think about quarterbacks who have, either, who have won an MVP, and won a Super Bowl are almost universally in the Hall of Fame. Theismann is not because um, he just didn't have the longest arc to his career. This is what really holds him down more than anything else. He was a, you know, like I said he was a Heisman finalist in 1970. He went to the CFL. He was two time All Star there, uh, and seven, from when he was there from 71 to 73, he joined. The Redskins in 74, and he didn't win the starting job until 78, where he was already 29 years old. So he ends up winning the MVP, but it's in his mid-30s. And then he has a shortened career at the end side, although he was starting to fall off when Lawrence Taylor shatters his leg. So Theismann's a guy, I feel like he's pretty underrated as far as someone who could potentially get into the Hall of Fame. Of course, it's been so long that you know his chances are, are long gone at this point. But I do think he's an interesting name that not a lot of people have thought about. Okay, another name that I would not have suspected if it didn't come up according to my formula is John Hadel here. 42nd overall, he had a 36th peak. I'm sorry, 46th peak, 36th career, rushing, playoffs. Everything's in the 40s. So he's kind of like a 40-ish sort of player across the board for everything that, that he had done there. He won an AFL championship and went had one first-team All-Pro. Uh, never, not going to the Hall of Fame, unlikely will be there. Six-time Pro Bowler. And he had uh, some other different Sporting News Player of the Year award in 1973. Well, he never won the MVP, the AP MVP. He was he did win from the Sporting News Player of the Year in 1973, which is an equivalent type of number. These San Diego Chargers teams were a lot of fun uh, back in the day, back when Hato played for them in the late 60s. Lance Allworth played with him there, who was probably the best receiver of that era. They were seen as kind of being a lot of advantages in playing in the NFL. It was an easier league. They had the best offensive coaches there, the best receiver. And he led the AFL in a passing yards a number of different seasons. And that's why he accumulated the numbers that he did. Um, again, he's not a player that I just I know a lot about as not being a real studier of the AFL back in the 1960s and early 70s. But he has the goods as far as the numbers are concerned. And again, the steady play is concerned there, just depending upon how much you want to discount it based upon the AFL and the inflated stats that you saw from that era. Okay, let's get to the last guy, number uh, 41. Oh, whoops, it says 43 on here. Apologies for, the, for anyone who's looking at this on YouTube, but it's, it should be 41. Bob Greasy, his career efficiency total accumulation is 24th. Big number there. Peak 65 is a little bit lower. His rushing is 50th and his playoff is 10th. He has amazing, amazing, amazing playoff numbers. So 
I think greasy for people who are thinking about someone a little bit more modern, like who's the equivalent you can think of when it comes to Bob Greasy. And again, Greasy's a Hall of Famer, unlike a lot of the guys we've seen here. Eight times in the Pro Bowl, two times he was all pro, two time uh, Super Bowl champion, and went to the Super Bowl another time. A guy that you would probably compare him to, I think, is Troy Aikman. For, for, for someone who's a little bit older and a similar sort of team, which is highly touted guy as far as being a prospect. He was the fourth overall pick in the 1967 draft. Aikman, of course, being the first overall pick in the draft. Played for a team that was dominant running the ball. The, the Miami Dolphins teams of the late 60s and early 70s, or through most of the 70s, dominant, dominant, dominant running the ball. Greasy never averaged more than 190 yards passing per game. And in some of these seasons, some of these seasons, he was as low as 110 yards per game, 120 yards per game, 140 yards per game. In some of these big seasons where they're going to the Super Bowl, low, low, low numbers, which hurts his accumulation for being able to put together a substantial peak, because even when he had great efficiency, it wasn't coming through as much. But you really can't doubt his efficiency. He had... He had nine, 10, 11 straight years of above average efficiency uh, starting in 1970, which was his fourth NFL season th all the way through the end of his career in 1980. He was above average efficiency every single one of those years. So I think he was a better player than Aikman during the regular season, at least, but it was a similar setup where he had two Hall of Famers on his offensive line. He had another six-time Pro Bowler and eight-time Hall of Fame finalist on his offensive line. He played with Paul Warfield, one of the best receivers of the generation. He played with Larry Zonka. And then Don Shula is head coach. You know, Don Shula, of course, the, the most wins ever by a head coach who coached the Baltimore Colts before that. And then the Miami Dolphins to all these championships and, and victories. Um. So I, I think, yeah, I think the comparison is really with Aikman, but Greasy, while he was good in the playoffs, he was pretty darn good in the playoffs. He wasn't great in the playoffs in the same sort of way, and he didn't have memorable Super Bowl performances. So despite the fact that they won a couple of rings, he wasn't seen as being that dominant on the Super Bowl side. And the famous 1972 Dolphins team, uh, the team that went, undefeated the only team in NFL history to go undefeated greasy started the season was injured in the fifth game and then came back for the playoffs so that was also maybe a little bit of a reputation burden for him is the fact that Earl Morrill was able to step in there uh, also not lose a game they were able to just continue cranking out yardage on the ground while he wasn't there and he didn't play particularly well that season which was the greatest season in Dolphins history and NFL history as far as the only team to be undefeated I think that hurts his reputation a little bit a little bit for Greasy but if I were going to lean Greasy versus Aikman we'll see Aikman later on here I mean maybe I would lean Aikman a little bit but I think Greasy is very very close to being that type of player he's just probably someone we've forgotten about a decent amount. And I know a lot of people think that Aikman is like the worst quarterback to be on the hall of fame. I'm going to school some people on that. Eventually when we get to Aikman, just how unbelievably awesome he was in the playoffs. And while he didn't put up big numbers, he was tremendously efficient also during the regular season. Not quite as good as great as greasy was though, during the regular season. All right, everybody, this was the QB goat discussion 50 through 41. I'm going to go on, to the next 10 after that and continue on in this sort of manner. Give me some feedback on the old YouTube if you want to see what I might discuss also on my Monday pods when I'm talking about the NFL news that's going out during the week. Uh, otherwise, I hope all of you guys have a restful and good uh, weekend coming up here. Good holiday weekend, I guess, even though technically we're talking about Monday for the 4th of July. And then otherwise, I'll be talking to everyone next week. Thanks so much, everybody.